The last time the Dusseldorf Boat Show took place, we were all blissfully unaware that the world was going to shut down for a couple of years. But now, as life gradually returns to normal, we're starting to remember where we left off. One of the new brands that caught my eye in Germany back in 2019 was the XS range of cats. The plans to have a new range of five models from 11 to 15 metres long was bold and ambitious, especially as XS was a new arm of Group Veneto, who already had the Lagoon range of cats. But apparently the target for the XS range was to be more performance orientated. And this is the flagship of the range, the XS15. She was passing through our patch, so we thought it was only sensible to take her for a sail. The first thing you notice is that compared to most of the boats in the river, she's big and she can't help feeling a little self-conscious. But out in the Solent and underway, that feeling soon disappeared. With a decent breeze and nothing in our way, I was surprised at how quickly we settled in, and particularly surprised at my own first impressions. Well, I have to say, this isn't what I was expecting. Although I'm not quite sure what I was expecting. Because if I'm honest, to me, a lot of the cruising multi hulls dare I say it, tend to look the same. But you don't want to make that mistake with this boat because it certainly isn't the same at all. The thing I love about this already is that it really is definitely a sailor's boat. The first thing you notice is that it's so direct on the helm. I mean, it is just like sailing a monohull. So you feel very much in control of the boat straight away. The sail plan is a good, decent sized sail plan that's pretty efficient as well and she just picks up. We came out here, it's blowing about uh, 18, 18 to 20 knots at the moment, but when we first came out, there was about 12 knots of breeze and we were doing 10 knots on a beam reach. And she just seems to want to do 10 knots, whatever you do. We put the code zero up a little later on and then we're at uh, 12, 13 knots. But sails really well, feels really good on the helm. The control lines are all very close to hand. They are all led back, pretty much all of them anyway, are led back onto the starboard side, which makes it very easy to uh, ease and sheet the jib, reef it. You can get to the main sheet traveler, which is close to hand as well. So all the controls are very easy to get to. But the other thing that I really like is the visibility. And multi hulls are big, and they often have a large bit of superstructure in front of you. And of course, this is no different. But what is different is that you can see through the windows all the way around to Lourdes. And there's literally just a tiny little sliver here where I can't see directly ahead. And if I do want to see it, I literally move around or this way. So it's really not a massive issue. It's certainly no more of an obstruction than looking through the foot of a Genoa on a great big overlapping head on a monohull. One of the other big debates in the cruising multi-hull world is whether you go for a flybridge helm position or a conventional helm position like this and the pros and cons that go with it. Personally, for me, I don't think there's any competition. I would far rather be here in touch and be able to see what's going on around me. But also, there is another issue potentially with the flybridge steering position and that is that you are rather alienated from the rest of the boat. You can't actually see what's going on down below. And I've certainly heard of people feel at times a little uncomfortable about that. And also, if you're short-handed, it's quite difficult if you're helming the boat from up on the flybridge to actually be to help with the handling of the boat, be it throwing lines, casting lines, casting off, pulling them on or, or whatever. So whilst that debate is one that seems to run and run and run. For me, it'll be this configuration each time. But there was still at least one key question that hadn't been answered so far. XS is owned by Beneteau, and Beneteau have already got a catamaran brand, Lagoon. So what was the thinking behind the excess? Why do they want to do this? So XS is a, an evolution of the demand for catamarans for people who want everything. So 
we've got the monohull market, the guys who love their monohull sailing, but the family, they love the catamaran life. You know, you've got all the space, you've got everything that comes from a cat, the wonderful wide berths, and you can fit so many people on board. But there's always a reticence from your monohull guy or lady who wants to still enjoy their sailing. And what XS have done is they've packaged up the whole lot. So you've got the catamaran with all the space, but you've got that synergy from a monohull into a cat with the aft helm positions. We haven't got the flybridge. You've got a bigger rig. You've got a much lower boom, more sail area. So it's all about, in my mind, it's about ticking every box. I mean, one of the key things, Matt, that you've got to remember, you know, you look at all the other competition generally, um, because you've got a flybridge, you have to have the boom uh, much higher. So, of course, without the flybridge, you've got lower boom, increased sail area, a much better, more efficient sail plan. But I, I think the, the, the Pulse Line rig, for me, is a must-have. It's an extra cost, but I think if you're keyed into what excess are doing, what you want from this boat, ultimately you want to be sailing more than the motoring, you've got to go for the Pulse Line rig. One of the options on this boat that you pointed out to me early, earlier on is the option to actually have some kind of seating on top. It's not a flybridge, is it? Explain, explain that. What's... So it's an option on the XS15 and they call it the Sky Lounge. So it's an area where you can be right, right up on the top of the boat and it's, it, it, it's instead of having the fly, when you, you know, when you have your flybridge position up there as you do on a conventional catamaran of this size, you have a big seating area. And that's really important for a lot of people. And you're not going to be up there when you're sailing, but you know, the time you're up there is when you're at anchor on your berth and you've got another area in the boat where you can relax, enjoy the sunshine or whatever it might be. Once you come forward from the helming positions aft, which is very easy by the way, it's straight up some big wide steps. There are handholds either side. She's a remarkably uncluttered deck layer. I mean, there's literally nothing on these side decks at all. Nice and wide, handrails here, guard wires, but nothing really sort of to trip over, apart from the Code Zero sheet, but you know, that's fine. But really simple. And it sort of seems to echo a theme that you see throughout this boat is actually she's a very simply laid out boat. She's got a very high aspect ratio, efficient looking mainsail, a self tacking jib, and of course a code zero. Who hasn't got a code zero nowadays? Moving around on board the boat also, I particularly like this area here. It's so easy just to step down all the handholds so they just fall naturally and you don't really have to go very far. I've been on multi-hulls where it feels like you're in a children's adventure park just trying to get out onto the foredeck. Now one of the considerations on pretty much any cruising cat is tacking. They're clearly not as nimble as monohulls but I've been very impressed with this one. Going through a tack it's really not a major issue. I'll just check into windward just to make sure we're okay. We've got about 23, 24 knots of apparent wind. So that's probably about 17 knots true. Admittedly, it's a very flat sea state. So in some ways you've got ideal um, conditions, but attack is no more difficult than this. As we went into the attack, we were sailing at about 50 degrees apparent. We had 10 knots boat speed. Come through the tack, out the other side, keep the bow down. We've slowed down to about six knots. I'm, I'm going to hold the bow down, just go down to about 50 degrees, maybe 60, probably don't need to, no, 50 degrees apparent. We're already at nine knots, 10 knots, and we're off. And that's at uh, 50 degrees apparent. I'm just going to come back up now, up up to 40 degrees. It really is as easy as that. We've probably got ideal conditions really for it, but even so, I've definitely sailed boats that multi hulls that don't perform like that. So, with the sailing trials ticked off, it was time to take a closer look at her accommodation. And as we made our way back up the river, she felt like she'd shrunk. 
She then demonstrated how nimble a big cat can be under power, before going large once again. When it comes to her accommodation, the first thing that you notice, in fact you can't miss, is that there's just so much space. But then again, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. She's 15 metres long after all, and she's 8 metres wide. So this is sort of familiar territory for this type of uh, multi-hull. But the other thing you notice is the styling. And it echoes in many ways the style on deck as well, in that it's a very simple, straightforward layout, but it's very, very nicely done indeed. Now toward design, were the people responsible for the interior design, and I frankly think they've done an extremely good job. They certainly appear to have spent an awful lot of time on the colours and the styles and the fabrics to try and, it feels like, to try and lift and create a feeling of space, but also of light. And I think in that respect, they've done an extremely good job. We talked about the good visibility from outside, as you see through these wraparound windows. And actually, when you're inside, of course, it's every bit as good. When it comes to the layout of her accommodation, she's pretty straightforward. Her galley is on the port side, where there's a hob and an oven arrangement, plenty of worktop space, a sink, a microwave, all the things you'd expect. On the starboard side, there are two large fridges and a freezer. In fact, this is a boat that's got plenty of fridges because there's another one down in the starboard hull and yet another fridge out in the cockpit area. But when it comes to the accommodation layout itself and the sleeping accommodation, there's really quite a huge range of options. Not least of all, you can sleep, according to the brochure, 6 to 14. That's pretty impressive. It's actually six cabins. There's two in each hull and then another pair underneath the hull, sort of in towards the centre line. This is actually the owner's version of the boat with just three cabins. And so on the port side, there are two double cabins there. And then on the starboard side, the owner's cabin is in fact not just the owner's cabin, it's the owner's hull. Because down here, you get the whole length of the hull, which makes for a huge cabin. Now, I appreciate that this is not rocket science and there are other manufacturers that do this, but nonetheless, it's pretty impressive. But apart from just the volume that's available in this starboard hull, the other thing that strikes me is, once again, it's the subtlety of the styling and the detail. One good example of that is this ring frame. Well, it's actually a cover over one of the structural members, one of the structural ring frames in the hull. But rather than covering it up and putting it behind other surfaces, they've decided to make a feature of it. And I think it works pretty well. It also accentuates just how beamy these hulls are, actually, and how much space there is within the structure of these hulls. Which, when you look from the outside, is quite interesting because they're chined right down just above the waterline. These hulls are chined, so they have a slightly narrower waterline beam where it matters, where you don't want the drag, but you get the volume up here. Other little details I like, well, I do like these little sort of leather pockets and the simplicity of the arrangement. And once again, it seems to sort of echo this, the, the same thing on deck where simplicity and ease of operation and just being a little bit more stylish and chic makes all the difference. So now, while there is plenty of volume throughout the boat in all the cabins, it's a theme that runs through all the stowage as well, because there's just lots of it and in big quantities. These lockers have just got plenty of space in them. In fact, behind these sliding doors, there's so much space you almost wonder whether it is actually another cabin. Not often you get to say that. And by the time you get to this bit in the starboard hull, which is the owner's side, you've got the heads in here. And then beyond that, a his and hers sink, lots and lots of space. Again, plenty of stowage. And then a shower that is, well, vast. In the port hull, there are two double cabins. One forward, one aft. And behind me are the heads that service both of those cabins, both individual heads, so plenty of space once again. Both cabins are beautifully appointed, simple, but loads and loads of space and loads and loads of volume. 
In fact, if you've got children, that might end up being a bit of a problem because if they like playing hide and seek, you're gonna have trouble finding them. One of the big advantages of cats is that you get two engines. Not only does that give you the advantage of redundancy, but it also helps when it comes to maneuverability. It means that you can turn even a big boat like this around on their own length. These engines, it's twin 57 horsepower Yanmars. And one of the other big advantages in a cat is you've got plenty of space around the engine to do maintenance. The sky deck is an interesting option. It'll certainly satisfy those that were tempted by the idea of a flybridge, but also tempted by the practicality and workability that this boat offers. It's not something you would use under sail, but it has to be said, it would be a pretty cool place to be spending the evening. So what does she cost? Well, her basic starting price is 745,000 euros XVAT. This boat in this spec, which is a pretty good spec with electric winches, the taller rig, the davits and some other items, she's 993,000 euros plus the VAT. If you're then gonna take her offshore and go even further afield and make her a blue water cruiser, you're probably going to want to add a generator, possibly aircon, and some other blue water extras. But overall, she's a fascinating boat. She's very easy to underestimate from the dock. But when you get her sailing, she's very different to a lot of the other cruising multi-hulls. Not least of all, because she is very much a sailor's boat.